Hi there, Doug Carlson again. I've had numerous requests to give an update on the Millionaire Next Door lifestyle consumption, that sort of thing of real millionaires. And I call this series of two videos, The Millionaire Dentist. Now part one is not going to be real palatable for some of you because it's going to talk about lifestyle and consumption and how much we as dentists in particular do consume, how much we do spend, and how those that have real wealth don't spend or what they spend their money on. So um, there's a series of books written by Tom Stanley. The first one that was really popular was Millionaire Next Door written in 1996. What I'm going to comment on today is an update to that. And there's several updates. I have the millionaire mind too. This one is called Stop Acting Rich and Start Living Like a Millionaire. It's got updated statistics as of 2009. That's after the Great Recession. So I think it's appropriate for uh, what we want to know. So I'm going to start out basically by telling you one of the main Posits that he has in this book and everything else he's written is nothing has a greater effect on your wealth than your choice of home and neighborhood. Now, normally I do this extemporaneously. I don't have notes. I don't have a teleprompter. Today I've got a big screen behind me with notes so I don't blow it. There's a lot of information I want to provide here. Some of it will be on the screen on the video, uh, but a lot of it is too much for me to memorize. So. I'll be looking away from the camera a bit. I apologize for that in advance. Nothing has greater effect on your wealth than your choice of home and neighborhood. Why? Because the pressure to spend more on every conceivable service is there, including gardeners, landscapers, domestic health, private schools, luxury autos, you name it. If you're in a more expensive neighborhood, the peer pressure is gonna be greater to buy and upgrade. Stanley talks about, in this book in particular, about aspirationals. Aspirationals occupy high-end neighborhoods. They're normally not millionaires at all. They have high occupational status and they have high income, high consumption. Later on we're going to call them income statement affluent. They make a lot of money, they spend a lot of money. What kind of occupations? Attorneys, doctors, dentists, managers of large corporations. He goes on to say that 2% of the rich, the real millionaires, are what he called glittering rich. Now these come normally from a class of people that are celebrities, sports heroes, that sort of thing. In another book he points out that the glittering rich are normally those that come from an economically depressed environment in their early years. In other words, they want to show the world that they're never going to have to go back to where they came from. Whereas the millionaires that don't spend a lot of money are not acting glitteringly rich and spending like crazy, uh, come from middle class environments. Glittering rich, the thing about them though is for the most part, they may spend a lot of money on parties, cars, homes and that sort of thing, but it's only a small fraction of their real wealth. A lot of them have upwards of $50 million and more. So, aspirationals though, want to be like the glittering rich. So what do they do? What's the lifestyle? Well, they shop at Saks Fifth Avenue, Neiman Marcus for their clothing. Uh, BMWs and Mercedes are the two top choices for cars. They love wine and spirits and have tons of bottles in their homes. Now, the real hook here, the real choice moniker of the glittering rich is that they serve gray goose vodka. Stanley makes a big point of this. This is the one thing that you gotta have if you want to look glitteringly rich is serve gray goose. Now interestingly vodka in this country by law can't have any taste other than what comes from the actual distilling process. So all vodkas taste the same by law. Not true of other spirits like gin, uh, whiskey, that sort of thing, and especially wine and beer. But vodka is basically all the same. You're paying for the advertising in the bottle. So Grey Goose, what's the difference? None. Obviously people say it tastes better, but realistically, chemically, it tastes the same. 
Well, how to look glitteringly rich. Now, Stanley spends a lot of time, and it's really, these books are all fun reads. They're easy, they have some stats in them, but they're easy stats to understand. He goes into, how do you really look rich? How can you look like the glitteringly rich? Well, first of all, if you don't have a huge home, don't entertain at home. Most of the aspirationals go to restaurants with their crew, with a group they want to entertain. Buy the most expensive entrees and the most expensive drinks, obviously. If you entertain at home, make sure that you have lots of bottle of wine, lots of spirits, high end, and in particular, he says, make sure you have a wine cellar. You can convert a room into a wine cellar. And beyond that, convince your neighbors and friends to store their wine in your wine cellar so you have even more wine. How do you do that? Well, there's units you, you can buy that are temperature and humidity controlled and just convince your neighbors that, man, I've got the best. It's guaranteed to not go within 0.1 degree of 53 degrees. The humidity is matched perfectly for the wines. In fact, we have a separate white and red wine section that we put things in. You can convince them that they need to store at your house. You put special locks, special uh, security in the room that you have the wine, that sort of thing. Anyway, interesting stuff. This is from, again, this book, which was purchased, uh, purchased, it was published in 2009, Stop Acting Rich. I think he has one since then, but this, this one is a real fun read. Well, he differentiates between two classes of people. Income statement affluent, which are doctors, attorneys, managers, that's us. Um, we like to buy Rolex watches, Cartier watches, Breitling watches, uh, income statement affluent, they like premium spirits, which we talked about, live in custom homes. Interestingly, another correlation, like the Grey Goose one, he says that there's a high correlation between Rolex watches and consumption. Rolex does not statistically equate with wealth at all. It does equate with high income and it does equate with debt. Now the thing is, is if you really want to be glitteringly rich, you can't have just one of these. You've got to have 31, one for every day in the month. And of course there's um, watch winders that you're going to need. There's display cases where you have your watches. You can spend definitely upwards of $300,000 to have the right watches in your collection. Good luck. I do not wear a watch. Since high school, they've driven me crazy. I was constantly looking at the time, so I don't even wear one. So thank God I haven't had that habit. Um, beyond income state affluent, there's balance state affluent. These are the people with real wealth. What are the occupations? Engineers, one, probably not a big, a big surprise. The other is teachers. Teachers have more wealth, by and large, than doctors. Isn't that amazing? Well, let's talk a little bit more about real millionaires and their spending habits. The median price of a suit that the millionaires buy is $300. Median price of a car, $32,000. And usually they're Toyotas or Hondas. Boats. Millionaires, by and large, do not buy boats. Or if they do, they turn around and sell it pretty quickly because of all the time, money, and hassle that they have. Second homes. Most real millionaires do not have second homes. Why? Because it takes too much time. Time is important to those with real wealth. Beyond that, he says that everyone under, underestimates the cost of the building if you're going to build the home. Furniture in particular, upgrades of course, maintenance, and the commute. So millionaires sometimes will buy a second home, but again, like boats, they sell them back pretty quickly because it's just too much hassle. It's easier to go to a four-star, five-star hotel and they save money. Price of homes. For the group between 2.5 and $5 million of total wealth, not including their home, the median price of a home is $600,000. Not cheap, but not a million dollar home. In fact, 90% of millionaires do not own a million dollar home. How much do millionaires spend for a haircut? $15 for men, $45 for women. Where do they buy their clothes? Well, there's a group of them that he lists and they're fairly close together. Nordstrom's at the top, but close behind is Macy's, Kohl's, Target, and Costco. They're fairly even in use. Nordstrom, of course, has good quality clothes. They cost more, but they're quality. 
How much do millionaires spend for wine? $15 on average. Dining out, one out of every 300 couples spends more than $100 regularly for the restaurant they like to frequent most. That's for two people, $100. One in 300 will spend more than that. Price of a suit, one in 900 will buy that $5,000 suit. One out of 1,000 basically. In other words, no one. Well, this gives you a little insight into the millionaire mind, how millionaires spend, uh, what their lifestyle is like. They don't spend a lot of money. They spend more time saving. Part two, we're going to talk about dentists in particular. You know, we are consumption oriented. We are income statement affluent, most of us. Why? Because we've been trained that way in dental school. Uh, our education has trained us to be that way. Peer pressure is that way. The public thinks that we should dress a little smarter, live in a little bit nicer home, drive a decent auto, uh, send our kids who should be smarter to private school. So we're thrust into this environment. It's very difficult to break out of the mold. I'm going to talk about a few ways in the part two where us that are income statement affluent and are not good savers can save money. Thanks for listening. Part two will pop up in just a moment here. Hi again, Doug Carlson, part two of the Millionaire Dentist series. Well, what can a dentist do? A lot of us are income affluent, but we really consume a lot and we don't save as well as we'd like to. And as I said in the previous video, we're put into a situation where we're expected to spend more, to have a bigger house, to have a nicer car, to have nicer clothes, to spend more on entertainment. That's just what we're pressured into. What can help? Well, uh, Stanley does help with some tips, but more than that, I've worked with about 30 dentists over the last five years who have wealth between three million and 10 million, not including their homes, by age 60. They have a lot of tidbits that can help out here. So, first of all, let's talk about the home. Key thing to remember is don't upgrade so often. Budget. Dentists with a million dollar home often spend 5% on insurance, maintenance, taxes, and upgrades. Upgrades in particular can eat up 3% per year. Well, on a million dollar home, 5% is $50,000. That's an awful lot. Not unusual. Somebody with a $300,000 home is going to spend about half of that percentage-wise, about 2.5% or $15,000 per year. There's a huge difference between $50,000 a year and $15,000 a year. That's $35K. And you know what? To save $35,000 a year is pretty much what we'd like to do long-term, $35,000 to $50,000 to be able to retire at a reasonable age. Stage your upgrades. Biggest defenders bathrooms, kitchens, and go into restoration hardware. I love their catalogs. They're fantastic. They have the best stuff, but it's very costly. Keep your furniture for 10 years, guys. You don't have to upgrade and keep changing it. Be careful. Young dentists, as far as homes, find a home in a modest neighborhood with the best public schools. So you don't have to worry about private. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Stanley makes a big point. People that generate real wealth tend not to live in high-end neighborhoods. They live in more modest, older neighborhoods. Clothing. Macy's and Nordstrom. Dentists that have generated a lot of wealth still go to these places, but they budget. They don't spend a lot. One of the key things that I've heard of and I've actually found is if you have unopened boxes of clothes that are laying around your walk-in closet, that's a huge warning. Don't do that. That means you need to slow down. Cars. Well, I make a big point of always buying used, always paying cash, always buying a Honda or a Toyota or a Nissan or something like that. You know what? It's not a huge deal to buy a Mercedes, Lexus, BMW. It's better to buy a couple years old. Body styles don't change that often. And you can save fifteen to twenty-five thousand. Is that going to make a huge difference long term? Not as much as your home, but it still is savings. Entertaining. Stanley spends a lot of time on entertaining, and 
Doctors in particular like to entertain. Here's some key things to do. Grey Goose. Get a couple bottles, buy a couple. Fill them up with cheap vodka. Nobody will know the difference, guests will love it. Buy mid-level mid wines and have a couple, three, four special wines that cost more. They may be 40, 50 bucks. That's not gonna put you out that much, but have a couple specialty wines. Catering. A lot of us like to cater. It's tough for any crowd whatsoever to cook for them. Catering. Pick a mid-level family restaurant. Yeah, you can do Panera Bread or Chipotle or something like that, but the guests will know it. Fancy restaurants you don't have to do. Mid-level that don't cost a fortune per person. They're going to give you big bang for your buck. They're going to work harder. They're not going to cost a fortune. They're going to give you a lot of food. Try that. The other key thing that I've found out over the years and have definitely done, have a theme for your party. This will supersede everything except the food. Trust me. Easy things to do. Have a Western night where people dress up country Western. Have a favorite teams night. I live in Denver, big Bronco area. Have a Broncos party. If you're in Dallas, have a Cowboys party. In Denver, most of the people are going to have Broncos clothes on. There's going to be some Green Bay people. There's always Pittsburgh ones, and they really have fun going back and forth. Have a bling night where you wear cheap blings all over the place. The women would love it. The guys, not so much, but the women would love it. Come as your mom or dad night. Dress up frumpy. That's always a fun thing to do. Anyway, to have a simple theme which doesn't cost people money, doesn't give you anything extra to do with any other decorations is a fun thing to do and they'll remember that much more so than the food or the, the booze that you serve. Boats and planes, rent them. I definitely know dentists that have bought boats, not so much planes. They don't tend to hang on to them too long because they're a hassle and they cost a lot. They're money pits. Watches, Rolex, that's okay to have one. That's not going to cost you a fortune. They look great, guys like them, but they have 30. Give me a break, that's absolutely crazy, but they have one. You've earned it, you've worked hard. To have nice jewelry is certainly great. Let's get back to private schools. A lot of you do have kids in private schools. That's okay. Yeah, it's definitely costing you $30,000 a year for two, sometimes $40,000. If they're boarding back east, it's a whole lot more than that. You're paying big bucks for private school. If you live in a neighborhood that has great public schools, you're safe. That works. But a lot of people have their kids in private schools. Going to college, here's a thought. Consider top-level public universities. The kids in private schools are going to be set up to go to the top-level schools anyway. Top-level rated schools that are public, University of California, Berkeley, the top one in the nation, harder than hell to get into, almost as tough as Ivy League, or maybe as tough in some instances. UCLA, right up there next to UC. The University of Virginia, UVA, top notch on the East Coast. Michigan in the Midwest, top rated. The University of North Carolina, another one. William & Mary, that's a public school on the East Coast. Wisconsin, Washington, University of Connecticut, Maryland, Pitt is a public school. There's a lot of them that are high level, prestigious, you get a very good education, and it doesn't cost you a fortune to go to school. Professional school, I'm not going to get into that in this lecture. That's a whole different ball game. But as far as private school versus public, public, I think you get a lot bigger bang for your buck. This is from a guy who went to a small liberal arts, expensive, high level, elite private college. My wife did too. She actually is an educator and has worked in the Cal State system, so she's seen the differences. High level public institutions are a great deal. Consider them. Well, hopefully this helps. These are hints from, again, dentists that have generated real wealth. Almost all of them are living a good life. They buy luxury cars in retirement. They live in nice homes. They're not scrimping on a whole lot of things. But during their practices and during their careers, they were able to save significantly. Hope this helps. Give me a call anytime for more questions or information.